Hi, Byron Martin here at Logie's Greenhouses, and today we're going to be talking about new plants we just received and what their light levels and fertilizer requirements would be. One of the really most important and key to successful growing of any plant is the light that they receive. And plants need either high light, which is full direct sun, and that's in a home or in a greenhouse or in a sunroom is the direct southern exposure. And those are generally plants that, you know, bloom a lot like hibiscus or bougainvillea and such things as that. And then we have partial sun, and that would be your begonias, slud, some of your gisneriads. And the low light is actually a north window or pulled away from your, to the sides of your east or west windows. There are plants that survive very well. Here's one example would be a philodendron that survive very well under really low light, and that's 10 feet away from the window in a corner of the room. Your Hoyas actually can grow under very low light. I always recommend keep them in a window. If you give them too much light, they'll actually, the leaves will actually yellow, and that's a good indication that you're giving the plant too much light. You start getting all this, you're fertilizing it, but the plant never greens up. That's a plant that actually is getting too much light. Keep them nice and green, you've got to give them a little bit lower light. As far as begonias go, um, their colors actually increase with light. And surprisingly enough, if you go to where begonias are grown in tropical areas of the world, you don't often find them in the deep understory. They're usually on road cuts or stream banks or places where there's, you know, uh, in between mounts of light coming in on them. And even some begonias grow right out in open fields, just like um, our goldenrod does here in New England. And then, as far as low light plants, there are plants like this Primulina tabacum that was actually found in a cave growing. And when we first got the plant into the greenhouse, we potted it up and we couldn't keep the leaves green. And then I was told by a grower that it was found in a cave. So we actually covered this over with more shade on top of it and it turned green. So it's a good indication of whether the plant is um, getting its normal amount of light as to the leaf color. But the thing you can't do is take a really high light plant and grow it under low light and expect to get results out of it. A good example would be an adenium. These plants grow right out in the bright, brilliant sun of North Africa, where the adenium obesum comes from. And if you put them under low light, they suffer and struggle. So remember, just put the plant where the sunlight is that will make them grow the best. And, um, and as you get to know your plant, you'll come to understand its light needs a little better. But start off with um, at least the recommendations. The next thing in terms of plant growth is fertilizer, and this can be a bit of a challenge to those of us that are not familiar with the plant. Some plants cannot tolerate fertilizer at all, it just burns them up. Yet, if you're going to be a gardener in a container, they're not going to get their fertilizer from anything else but you. So you need to um, apply fertilizer judiciously. And remember, there's two cycles to it. There's winter time when they're not growing very much and you just stop feeding. It's better to just discontinue your feed through the winter time. We're here in October, it's time to stop. And then you go November, December, January, February, things start to wake up. And when you see that first flush of growth in the spring, that tells you that it's time to start feeding. And there's a couple things you can do. You can use these granular organics that we have. There's many different brands of that. These um, are simply taken out and sprinkled on the top of the soil. We call it top dressing and watered in. Organic fertilizers tend to be organic in that they're biologically active. So if you want to scruff it in with your fingers a little bit, that kind of keeps that organic material buried a little bit. Um, and the other thing to do is to get a liquid fertilizer where you mix it with water. Whatever the recommendation is, probably cut it in half. It's better to iron on the lean side. You can always increase it rather than dump a whole lot on. And I remember when I first started growing plants, I was probably 12 years old. I came over to the greenhouse and I got some seeds and I planted them. And um, my father gave me a little area where I could culture them and they sprouted. And then I went to his fertilizer bucket and I scooped out a whole bunch of fertilizer and I dumped it in the water and stirred it up and watered the plants on My father came back and asked me what I was doing and um, he said, you're going to kill them. And I did. I killed them. I, I just, I, you know, I had no idea as to how much these plants need. They didn't need a hundredth of what I gave them. And I learned my lesson pretty quickly about how to feed plants. You know, there's lots of different formulas in terms of um, fertilizing. What we also recommend is a balanced fertilizer. There's 
the macronutrients of N, P, K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. And, um, you know, they need to be in sort of a balance. You don't want something that has a whole lot of nitrogen in it and very little of anything else because that's just going to make a whole lot of green leaves and no flowers. So most plants that receive fertilizer receive it as a mixture of those three macronutrients. Also with fertilizers nowadays, they have micros in it, this, the minor nutrients, and those are usually inorganics naturally or in the synthetic or chemical fertilizers as an additive. One of the questions we get in terms of um, growing is, should I water from the top going down through or should I water in the source and let them wick them up? And the answer to that is water from the top down. Um, we do in horticulture have what's called sub-irrigation and that is where the benches are flooded and the plants wick the water up. Um, it does keep the foliage very dry in an intense horticultural situation, which is a good thing, but we have to constantly monitor the fertilizer levels in the soil. They're not being leached or moving through the soil, they're going up and accumulating. So the best thing to do is to water from the top down. If there's a Gisneriad, um, African violet family, where you're going to get staining, just don't water the leaves. Just be careful with your watering pot. Or don't do it when the sun's on it with tepid water. And that will solve that problem of leaf staining. Um, but, you know, our recommendation is always water so the fertilizer is moving through the soil out into the saucer. The quality of the water is also important. It's really kind of a difficult thing to say because it depends upon where you live. But water quality is very varied throughout the country. Um, there's some areas that have hard water or alkali water, and those irrigation waters can be really difficult on plants because they're constantly trying to raise the pH of the soil up rather than where plants like it, which is slightly acidic or acidic. So if you happen to be in an area where you have an alkali situation, it's better to find alternative sources of water to water your plants. Many of our customers will collect rainwater to solve that problem. One other issue that we often find, particularly with municipal water, is high chlorine levels. Some plants are sensitive to it, many are not. But um, in the case that you have sensitive plants, it's better to uh, fill your watering pot up and leave it overnight and let that chlorine evaporate out. Thank you for watching. There's a little bit of information on what to do when you receive your plants from Logies. If you'd like more information, visit us at logies.com.